you know, we painted quite the picture of God's design for marriage, and I, 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 I have just sort of fallen in love with Song of Solomon. However, I recognize that, um, and I say this very carefully, I think sometimes we, we can be in danger of actually creating an idol in marriage. So we can make marriage itself an idol and, and excuse a lot of behavior uh, because it is part of God's good design. Um, and, and so for people who grow up in this christian church culture actually can somewhat have a bit of a distorted view of marriage, even though it's God's good design. They hear it preached about and there's marriages all around them. I, I think sometimes we can still get it twisted in the sense that uh, we view and young people can start to view marriage as just the avenue for sex. And so I'm supposed to abstain from sex until I'm married, so get married quick. And we start to treat sexuality and marriage, you laugh, maybe, internally. But internally, we, we, we've created this idea that um, somehow marriage is to make life happy and better and good, and that's it. And if marriage is the object of worship, instead of the one who created marriage, marriage can very easily become an idol. I can safely say that because I've seen Christian people enter into a marriage that is completely against God's design. And they're willing to try to justify it because they feel like marriage is the end goal rather than holiness and honoring the Lord with their life. Marriage has become an idol to that person. And so I want to be really careful that as we come out of Song of Solomon, I want to tackle some issues that are facing our culture today. I spent uh, the early part of last week reading through with a fine teeth comb, or fine tooth comb, Bill C6. Everyone familiar with what Bill C6 is? The anti conversion therapy bill, which is really going to affect you as parents. It's going to affect this church, it's going to affect our culture a great deal. However, I will say that we have to be very clear on what we know to be true of marriage, of gender roles, of all these different things, because I think the church has been guilty in the past of some horrible atrocities. Horrible treatment of people with same-sex attraction. Horrible treatment of people who are going through uh, uh, this battle and this wrestling match with gender... um, fluidity and and trying to weigh out all this other stuff and we have not taught adequately on it we have not equipped our people to face this and so I wanted to take a number of weeks to actually wrestle through some of the things that are going to come out in Bill C6 but more than that who are we as Christians and and how does that trans you know how does that play out so we're going to talk about things like uh, gender roles the uniqueness of gender We're going to talk about homosexuality. We're going to talk about singleness. We're going to talk about uh, identity today. But we're going to tackle some of these subjects because the Bible does give answers for them. In so doing, as as I've been wrestling with this for the last little while, I've been talking to pastors about Bill C6, and there's a lot of fear. People are scared because we feel like we're going to be thrown in prison if we preach anything against homosexuality and and so on and so forth. And that might happen. However, I don't think we need to be as scared of Bill C-6 as maybe you have been in the past. Uh, Because the Bible actually paints a very good picture of sexuality. It gives us a good understanding of what gender is. It gives us helpful insights in how how to love those in the LGBTQ community around us. Maybe that is also true in our own families. It does not mean that we have to sever every relationship and have public burnings outside. That this has been the horrible atrocity in the treatment of human beings created in God's image who are maybe outside of the family of God or maybe are wrestling with this and want to know how can they be a Christian and wrestle with these same-sex attraction things. So for many of you, this is going to be a very uncomfortable series of sermons, and that's very good. Because when you're uncomfortable, it likely means we're tackling something that, that is hitting close to home um, and likely is, 
is, is going to touch on a nerve that you, you might be upset in some of this, but this is why I want to try to keep it as biblical as possible for the next number of weeks. We're going to be wrestling through Scripture together. Um, me just a little bit ahead of you as far as timeline goes. Uh, a lot of this I have not spent a great deal of time wrestling through, and it's been very humbling for me even this last week. So I want to pray, and then I want to ask you a very profound philosophical question. Are you ready for that? Father God, thank you for your word. Uh, Lord, as we get started on this series of sermons, Lord, I, I would humbly come to you and ask that you would teach me. Uh, more than just teaching me your principles, would you teach me your heart? Just teach me about who you are and your character. Help us to model that first, rather than holding coldly to to something that we feel, we believe, or we feel is laid out in Scripture. And I would pray, Father, that you would just be teaching us, um, helping our hearts to be sensitive. And Lord, would you actually divinely give us opportunity within our community and within our families to speak into the lives of people who are hurting because of preconceived ideas or because of uh, these issues that they're wrestling with, whether it be same-sex attraction or gender issues or uh, confusion over how you feel about them. And I pray, Father, that you would stir in our hearts here and help us to be missional-minded, others-minded, and yet firm, firm on what you teach. So help us to balance that well. Help me to be gracious and yet uh, loving enough to say what, what you would have me say. And help me not to be foolish enough to bring my own ideas into this. I ask for your help and for all of us in Jesus' name. Amen. Ready for the question? Who are you? Who are you? If I, I'm going to just, we're going to give just a few moments of signs. If you've got a pen and the bulletin, whatever you want to use, I want you to write down a list of things that define who you are. If you don't have a pen, I don't know what you should do. You, you draw on your friend's back or something. I don't know. Um, that's, that's fine. Just come up with a list in your brain. What defines who you are? Who are you? I don't want, I don't want answers. This is not one of those uh, interactive moments, okay? It's going to be a really awkward video to watch, just so you know. Who are you? Looking at your list right now, are there some of those things, maybe keep adding to it if you want as we go, are there some things on there that in an instant could be taken away from you? Anyone? Yeah? That that, that thing in your identity could change. Now, I, I say that because we want to be careful not to base who we are solely on those things. Those things all play an important role in, in making us a little bit of who we are, but our true identity is what we're going to talk about today. Who are we that is unshakable? Now, any, anyone heard this phrase today? We, we talk about identity politics and this whole idea of identity today. Um, uh, this is a common battle. It, it, it is the greatest goal in life today. is to discover who you are and then live it out. Amen? You've got to figure out who you are and then live it out as best as you possibly can and as vibrantly as you possibly can. That's what most people would define as identity. It is, it is a definition of self and an expression of, of who you are. And so if identity is that, then it must be accepted by other people, correct? Because that's just who you are. And other people must accept who you are, because that's just the way that maybe God made you. 
Now, that may be true. Now, I, when we talk about identity, I'm not here to smash up your idea of identity, but I want to tell you that we can often formulate our identity with these things that are temporal, with these things that are, are secondary, and it is the combination of all of those things that is the reason that many people struggle with identity. Because for a while, I'm a mom, and then my kids grow up, and all of a sudden my world is rocked because all my kids are gone. And I don't know what to do with myself. Part of who I am has changed. Your marriage maybe looks different than it did when you started. Or maybe you are single and your idea of, of what a true identity should be would be that you're married but you're staying single. So I, I don't get it. How am I supposed to live this out? I, I want to be over there but I'm not there. And so am I really complete? And Do you see what I'm saying? And we create many of these things, and so we make things like gender a big part of our identity. We make our sexual preference. We make our marital status. We, we make all of these different things. Now, those I don't want to diminish them, but I want to say that all of those things are secondary. They're all secondary. So how do we know what our identity is? And here is the beautiful news of the gospel. The gospel can give us an identity that cannot be shaken. Now, we need an identity confirmed by somebody. We need somebody to speak an identity to. This is why very often on, you know, whether it be social media or wherever else, we're looking for approval of what I feel my identity is. I've come up with some conclusion of what I think defines me as a human being, and so I express that, and 300 people comment and say, good for you, live it out. Now, has my identity changed? No, but we're looking for cheerleaders. We're looking for somebody to confirm for us that this is a good decision for me to make. But the problem with that is, it's a decision that you made. And so what happens when you change your mind? Or when you get fed up with that? Well, all of a sudden, those same people you're going to go to, and, and you're going to make a different decision, and they're going to say, yeah, no, no, I, I don't like that. But you're going to find other cheerleaders, and you're just going to change your cheerleaders as, as long as your identity changes. And so it's this ever-changing longing and trying to seeking that, that this world is full of, and it's, that lo it, it's a feeling of lostness, trying to find out who you are that we want to try to, try to tackle. Now, I find it really interesting in Philippians chapter 2, verse 7. We get this great picture of who Jesus is. In Philippians 2, verse 7, does anybody here still rock the old King James? I need someone with an old King James uh, to, to read this verse for us. Verse 6 and 7. Maybe nobody has the King James. If you don't know what you have for a Bible, read it anyway. Somebody read Philippians 2, verse 6 and 7, and I'll tell you what the King James says. I'll read it. Okay, let's move on. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not consider equality with God a thing to be grasped or held on to. But he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in likeness of men. So God is going to speak to our identity, and what gives him the right to do that? What gives God the right to speak about who we are? Amen to that. So what has been the first underpinning of maybe a hundred years ago, or for the last hundred years, there has been this undercutting of creation. Have you seen that? If we can do away with the creator, then I am the definer of who I am and how I express myself. No one has the right to make claim or lay claim on me. But God says, no, not only have I created you, what else has he done? According to verse 7. He has become like us. Now, here's where the King James is neat. But mine, mine says, but he emptied himself. What does yours say? Made himself nothing. Took on the form of a servant. Laid aside his privileges. The old King James says it this way, and this is actually a very accurate translation. 
He became of no reputation. Do you see what we're talking about? He, took, he gave up that, that deity. He didn't give up his deity. Sorry, don't, don't mishear that. He did not give up his being God, but he made himself of no reputation. He laid that aside. He laid that aside to give us an identity. Let's go to the book of Colossians. So what gives him the right? Not only did he create us, but he also gave himself up for us to give us the identity that our soul is craving. Or, more importantly, to restore to us the identity that we've messed up by sin. So when we talk about identity, by creation, God has given us identity. By sin, we've distorted it completely. We've made our identity about our sexuality. We've made our identity about our gender. We've made our identity about everything else. That makes us who we are. Now, let's go to Colossians chapter 3. Um, and we'll, we'll read a number of verses here. I want to just read it plainly, starting in verse 3. Colossians 3, verse 3. For you have died. This is speaking to Christian people. So, you're dead. That's your identity right now. You have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you. Meaning that we, we come up with all these ideas, these earthly ideas of what is valuable. Put to death what is earthly in you. Sexual immorality, impurity, passions, evil desires, covetousness. So maybe your job, maybe money identifies who you are. Which is idolatry. On account of these... The wrath of God is coming. In these you too once walked while you were living in them or finding your life in them. But now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, obscene talk from your mouth. Well, why bring up those things? Let me tell you why. When we try to manufacture our identity, it is always in comparison to somebody else. I am a good businessman. Well, Compared to who? I am a good husband, or I, I have a great marriage. Compared to who? You know, I can express my, se my sexuality in this way, unlike those people. There's always comparison and contrasting, and so what is going to happen in this war for identity is all of those things that are just described there. When we try to manufacture our own identity, verse 8 becomes true. But you must put those things away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. There is, a, there is a hatred that comes when someone does not line up with my ideal of what a, a true identity should be. And sadly, this is also true of the Christian. When a Christian does not act or behave in a way that we think they should by comparison to us... They're not acting in a holy way. So we're going to answer the question later on, can a person continue to struggle with same-sex attraction and maintain a healthy, vibrant life, not acting out that same-sex attraction, but can a person have that and still be a holy and godly Christian? Well, some people are going to say, well, no. God's created us to be this and all this other stuff. And we create this idea that, you know, to be that, you have to be have to have a heterosexual marriage and that marriage has to be good and you have to have children. And we have this standard that we've created and it becomes idolatrous and we start to tear down, to be malicious, and to beat up on people who maybe don't fit our pattern. Verse 9, so don't lie to one another, seeing that you have put, uh, put off the old self. See this now. So we put off the old self. Who we used to be. Who we used to be. We put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of the Creator. Verse 10, underline it. We're going to build on that. Here there's no Greek, Jew, circumcised, uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free. But Christ is all and in all. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, so also you must forgive. And we're going to stop there for just a second. Um, and we're going to see that down verse 18, we talked about it in Sunday school, that very much 
of verse 18 and on talks about our everyday life in relation to other people, whether that be husbands and wives or our relationship to our boss or uh, our relationship to our parents and our children and all these different things. And so I think this is a, a very fitting passage to say we put off the old self and as a Christian to find our identity now by putting on what Christ has called us to be. And that is, I would say, to return back to the fall. Because here, do you see the picture there in verse 10? What are we supposed to do? Or ver- yeah, sorry, back in, yeah, verse 10. And have put on the new self which is being renewed in knowledge after... After what? The image of the Creator. So we're going to talk about Genesis chapter 1, and it's going to point us to the fact that man and woman were created to bear the image of God. So part of our identity is, not part, our identity is an image bearer of God who tells the gospel story for everyone to see. Now in that... There is no distinction. All of us are the same. All of us have the same role, the same goal to play. That's why it it goes on. Here there's no Jew or Greek or circumcised, uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. Now here there's not the mention of male and female, and I think that's very important. That this is not a, a cultural thing. That's what it's saying. It's not depending on what culture you're living in. This is true for everybody that in Christ we are new creations, according to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. So with with this, this new creation idea, we're called to bear witness to who God is. But I want you to remember that we are created beings, correct? Yes? Okay. With that in mind, let's go to the book of Romans chapter 1. We are created beings. Keep that in your mind. Chapter 1, verse 18. Just before this, it gives us a great picture of how this identity, we're going to find this identity. How are we going to find this identity? And it says, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God for salvation for everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also the Greek. But I thought there was no distinction. Well, there isn't, because both are recipients of grace by what Jesus has done. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is being revealed from faith for faith, meaning that in order to live out the gospel in whatever circumstance God has called you in, same-sex attracted, struggling with something, struggling with gender, in order to live out the faith that God wants us to have, it's going to take faith. That, that transformative power of God is going to give us uh, that ability to do. It is being revealed from faith for faith, meaning that it's lived out by faith. As it is written, the righteous will live By faith. Now we go. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all unrighteousness, or sorry, ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. I mean, there's truth that we've squashed down. We've we've made little of things that are meant to be big. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power, and divine nature have been clearly perceived even ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. Now where does your mind immediately go when you read that verse? Most of your mind. Just honestly. What shows you how powerful God is? How great and majestic and awesome? Yeah. Okay, there's billions of stars and they're millions of light years away and they're massively bigger than than our planet earth and who are we so yeah god is huge right anyone else that's nobody else thinks about this apparently most of you think of how many people think of creation and are just amazed at who god is yeah Have you lumped yourself into that? It's a tendency for all of us to look out and to observe everything but forget that we, remember we said it, are created beings supposed to do what? We're supposed to give and to bear testimony to the type of God that He is. 
And how are we supposed to do that? Starting in verse 21, let's read this now. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God, nor did they give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking, and their hostile hearts, or their foolish hearts, were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools, and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal men and birds and animals and creeping things. So idolatry creeps in. Now we all have this idea that it's a little wooden thing or a gold thing that we put on the mantelpiece and worship that, and it might look like a bird, it might look all these things, but it might be that the true idolatry today is self. Yeah? We've made the object of worship me. Am I happy? Am I able to express how I want to express myself? Am I willing and able to indulge my sinful desires? And for that reason, this is the foolish thinking that God is confronting here. He says, the reason you were made is to point to me, not to you. Stop treating your marriage that way. It's not about you. It's not about what you can get out of your spouse. It's not about how many uh, dollars you can make. It's not about all these different things. It's not about how you get to express yourself. It's about me. And so we are a part of a much higher calling than you maybe ever thought. So when, we talk, when we're going to talk about, in the next number of weeks, about gender, when we're going to talk about sexuality, and when we're going to talk about all those different things, we need to remember that it's not about us. It's about Him. Within that, there are a tainting of sin within all these things that we, are, we, have, been, we have tarnished our lives with. We're, we've been distorted in our thinking. We, we are twisted in our mind in the way that we, we live. But I want to tell you that you're, God wants to redeem you. So these longings, these hurts, these, the confusion, the things that might be going on in your life, those people who might be struggling with some of these things because it doesn't seem to fit the pattern that you thought would point to God. Remember that if God created you and he knows your uniqueness, if God created you as a male, he created you with a, as a male to point to him. Not to exert some power over other people to make much of yourself. If God created you as a female, he created you uniquely, you uniquely to point to him in your unique character. Not everyone has to look exactly the same. If God created you to be single, he's created you to be single to point to him and to show his sufficiency. God doesn't make these mistakes to belittle us, but he raises us up and he creates us in a powerful way to point to how finite and little God is, what's creation supposed to show? Hmm? His awesomeness. So your identity is wrapped up, and this is what I love about the church, it's a collection of a bunch of mismatched weirdos, all of us. We don't have any business belonging together. Half of you wouldn't choose to hang out. We're going to go and eat together after this. But the unique part is that in Christ, God brings us together so that every one of us in our unique, quirky little way points to who he is and how awesome he is. That God would take the ward off of Don's wrist and say, Don, you're supposed to show other people about how great I am. Suzanne, you're supposed to express and show this, the beauty, even of something as simple as putting flowers out there and to show how creative God is that Uniquely, every Sunday, there's a different flower sitting in that vase. Every one of us, unique, called to make much of who God is. Let's go to Genesis chapter 1, and we'll wrap it up here. So we need to be very careful not to make idols out of things like gender and sexuality. Any, it, it's an illusion to think that you can make, take the things that are created and make them the focal point and not be idolatrous. So if your identity is wrapped up in your sexuality or your gender or your marital status or all these different things, you're on the brink, if not full-blown, into idolatry. So we need to find our identity, first of all, in Christ. Because Christ is transforming us to do something that is very, very powerful. And that is to paint a picture, a mighty picture of who God is and a great picture of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now let's go to uh, Genesis chapter 1.
starting in verse, uh, let's go verse 23, verse 24, sorry. And God said, let the earth bring forth uh, living creatures according to their kinds, livestock and creeping things and, and beasts of the earth according to their kinds, and it was so. And God made the beasts of the earth according to their kinds and the livestock according to their kinds and everything that creeps along the ground according to their kind. And God saw that it was all very good. It was all good. So everything that God made was good. Then you get this very strong word, beginning of verse 26, it says, then, then God said. So unique from all else in creation. This is the final day of creation. Everything else has been made, and God looks and he says, and he says this, let us, us plural, make man in our plural image after our plural likeness, and let them, man, man and woman, let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. Did we see that in Colossians? Right? We reflect the image of God and that's what a transformed life is trying to do. So the Spirit of God working through the Word of God in the people of God is going to make us more like we were created to be undoing the, the tarnishing of sin and, and the mess that we've made of it, and it's going to make more of God and less of us. So when our identity is found in this, when we are people, created beings, made to bear the image of God, in the image of God, He created Him, man, male and female, He created them, male and female. Both male and female were created with the purpose of bringing glory to who God is, painting a big picture of the character of God. Then it's going to go on. It's going to talk about uh, this wonderful, this is a, everyone should memorize this one. And God blessed him and said, be fruitful and multiply. Uh, and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea. And then it goes on and on and on. Now why talk about that here? Because what was created is meant to create again. It's meant to reproduce. It's not meant to stay stagnant that your identity should lead to another person that bears the identity, uh, the, the image of God in a unique way too. So my sons will bear the image of God unique from how I will bear the image of God and how Marcia will bear the image of God. But together, me and Marcia and you and your spouse or you as an individual bear the image of God as He intended. Now, it was not good for man to be alone because God wanted both sexes. Both sexes are important in this because each gender plays a role in bearing testimony to who God is. Now, how did God refer to himself in verse 26? See it there? Let us, us, who's the us? God and the angels? God and the birds? God and the donkeys? Who was it? The Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, the three persons of the Trinity existed long before man did. And let me tell you something else that existed long before man did. I want to take you, I'll read it if you want to go there, go ahead. 1 Peter chapter 1, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse, uh, I'm going to read verse 17. And if uh, you call on him as Father, who judges impartially according to um, everyone's deeds, con conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile knowing that you were ransomed from your futile ways, inherited from your forefathers. This is what naturally is passed down, just by generation to generation. But there should be a spiritual offspring that is also being born um, and recreated, inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. He was foreknown when? Before the foundation of the world was made, manifest in the last times for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. Now why is that important? Because not only are we supposed to bear, bear the image and, and give a picture of who God is and what he's like in his Trinity, which I'll talk about in just a second. Uniquely, the woman bears this idea that there is submission within the Trinity. Weird, right? That's a, that's a word we want to do away with. There's submission within the Trinity. The Son submits to the Father. The Spirit submits to the Son. 
and, and yet there is love. There's love within the Trinity. That's how it's possible for God to be love. He existed in love even before man was created. If man hadn't been created at all, God would still be in his character love. And so it de- reveals in his character the uniqueness of the genders and the uniqueness of the sexes. But then it, it's going to go on to talk about this fact that from the foundation of the world, the gospel was already in God's mind. Before man, before Adam and Eve, before the animals, before all this other kind of stuff, the whole reason was that in marriage, in this beautiful picture in the garden before the fall, God had already anticipated that you people are going to paint a picture of the gospel. You're going to show to all of humanity the good news of how much God loves us. That Christ will love the church and give himself for her, and the church is meant to submit to, uh, submit to him. And so this idea uh, of being image bearers is not just to bear witness about what God is like, but also what God has done. What God has done in the gospel. So we have a pretty profound role to play, do we not? Now, as identity goes, we are children of God. Remember what we talked about? The Adam and Eve are supposed to be fruitful and increase. The, the father um, has born offspring. We are adopted as sons and born of imperishable seed here. It talks about that's a sexual language. And the idea is that he has born sons and daughters that would bear his image, that would point to him. But our identity is found in being a part of the family of God. That's a pretty amazing thing that not only is there responsibility, but there's also the authority and the power to do it. So we're going to talk about things for the next number of weeks that may seem worldly impossible. That God might want to take who you are, as broken and as needy as we are, and want to transform it, and you're going to say, well, no, I don't think that that seems too hard. It doesn't seem right. Uh, It doesn't seem like God would want that. And what might come natural to your mind might actually be the opposite of what God is trying to accomplish. Remember that we're about something much higher than just marriage, than just gender, than just sexuality, than just our expression of whatever, however I want to express myself. It's all about God. It's all about who He is. And all about what He has done for us in the Gospel. This beautiful picture here, we are bought not with perishable things like silver or gold or any of those things. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world but is made manifest in the last times for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. All this points to who he is. And what Christ is going to do and is doing in your life is pointing to how great God is and how much he cares for us. Father God, I probably have fumbled around a little bit with this, but many of us wrestle with our identity. Lord, it's because it's, it has made us unstable and self-conscious and concerned with how other people view us all the time. Lord, help us to be concerned more with how you view us. We want to be faithful to you first. And in so doing, we recognize that you have given us great gifts, gifts of friendship and gifts of relationship, gifts of children, gifts of spouse. But help us to view these things not in an idolatrous way. Help us to view them as good gifts which are meant to Uh, be compatible with us so that we can show the character of God by our submission to you. And so we thank you for your word, and we ask now that in the next weeks as we prepare uh, to study some of these things that society would would raise up as, as uttermost importance, I would pray, Father, that we would be able to put them in right place and turn our attention onto onto you. Lord, we thank you for your table. Now, as we take this table, we recognize that this is just another picture that we're meant to regularly take to remember how much you love us. That you would lay aside all the glory of heaven and make yourself of no reputation to give us a name and an identity that we never had before. Your sons and your daughters, children of the living God. I thank you for adopting us as sons, and I pray, Father, that If there are those who are feeling distant and on the outside, I pray that they would come and find uh, health and healing for their soul. 
and coming into your presence and finding their identity and their security wrapped up in who you are and what you've done for us. So Lord, as we take this communion table, deal with us, help us to put off our old self and help us to put on our new self. This is the new covenant in your blood, which is for us. To bring us all together, slave, free, Jew, Gentile, male, female, all of us come together around who you are. We thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to have our guys come up here and help serve communion. Uh, if you're a part of, uh, part of the body of Christ, if you've